Thank you, Saul. Good morning. Poetry, police, purpose. Uh, I've had a, uh, the privilege of a 40-year study and uh, work around the power of purpose. So my story is to share what I've learned around this, this uh, purpose experiment. And what I've been studying for all this time uh, resides in one single question. So the question that I've been living in uh, all this time is this. What makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? What makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? And what we see both from the science or the research and the story on this that people that don't have a good reason to get out of bed in the morning don't live as long, they're not as productive, and ultimately not happy and uh, well. And uh, so uh, I started on this journey, this, this question, when I was 26 years old, I had the uh, profound experience of being with Viktor Frankl. I was a graduate student at the time in counseling psychology, and I was in a program where Frankl was uh, the presenter, and it changed my life forever. Many of you, or perhaps most of you, know Frankl through his book, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, the Library of Congress um, contends that uh, Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, which is in multiple languages, sold millions of copies, is the, in the top 25 books that have shaped America. And it's actually number 12 on that list of, of 25. So the whole uh, question of meaning, as Frankl told his story about being uh, in the concentration camps and being liberated from Auschwitz, uh, his whole family was killed, his pregnant wife, his uh, siblings, his parents all uh, murdered. He survived, and when he, when he, was, li when he was liberated, he weighed eight, uh, 89 pounds. And he went home and healed, and he wrote Man's Search for Meaning in nine days. And the central message that I received from that is this. He says, the last of the human freedoms is choice. It's to choose what you want your life to be about. But it's also to choose moment to moment what you want your life to be about. And he said the people in the concentration camp that tended to survive were people who got up in the morning and gave somebody else a crust of bread, a kind word, envisioned their, their beloved. But they had something outside of their own self-interest that was part of their uh, reason uh, to get up in the morning. And I was uh, so moved that I became a student uh, of this and have been studying it ever since. So let me share with you four different experiences that I've had uh, that hopefully might have some value to you as you answer the question for yourself. Everybody's an experiment of one. Every morning's a new day, and the question, why am I getting up today, is kind of the the, the central question for me. We've talked a lot about passion. We've talked a lot about why people, why there's only 20 or 30 percent of people who love their work. Uh, I want to share a formula to, in just a minute for what I think that is, is, is all about. But uh, uh, first of all, uh, when I started down this path, I started to interview elders. I started to interview people over the age of 65. And what got me to do that was that my father retired and died within 24 months of retiring. How many of you know somebody who retired and either died literally or psychologically flattened out, died, that kind of thing? So a lot, lot, lot of hands. And I was wondering, what's this all about? Why is this transition so difficult? And so I started to interview elders, and I called people over the six, uh, or I did call people over the age of 65 <laughs> elders. <laughs> And uh, now that I'm 66, I'm changing that. But, uh, and I asked them this question, if you could do your life over again, what would you do differently? And there were three responses, and I've done this for 30 years. Every two years as I write and as I do the work I do, I, I once again, and I do it uh, outside of the U.S. It's not just a U.S.-centric uh, point of view. And uh, the three themes that come when I say, if you could live your life over again, what would you do differently? Theme number one is I'd be more reflective the second time around. Uh, reflective means I just step back and look at the big picture. So often people don't look at the big picture until when? 
Now there's a crisis, medical, financial, relational, and then we stop and we say, well, what have I been doing? And we step back to look at, at the big picture. Second response was, if I could live my life over again, uh, I would take more risks the second time around. And the risks that they would take were not the risks of climbing mountains or kayaking rivers. They were the risks of authenticity and voice and wishing they would have brought more of themselves into the equation relative to their parenting, their relationships, their work. As Freud said, work and love, two of the major arenas for, our, for our, our, our energy. The third theme of the interviews was if I could live my life over again, I, would ha I wish I would have uh, discerned earlier in my life my own bottom line, what really matters. Every single human being I've ever interviewed ultimately has said they want their life to matter. They want to make a difference. They want to leave a thumbprint or a, f a fingerprint of some sort. And it doesn't have to be a big thing, but it has to be real. And it has to feel authentic uh, to them. So that, that purpose piece is, is the study. I've been leading now. Uh, so first point is the elders. Frankel talked purpose and meaning. The elders talk purpose and meaning. Third, our second point, is that uh, I've been uh, leading walking safaris in Tanzania, East Africa, for the last 27 years. My good friend Alan Weber uh, has been with me. You can talk with him about uh, what that's all about if you have, have any, any uh, interest. But in East Africa and Tanzania, I have had the privilege of sitting with elders around the fire for many years. And a few years back, I uh, was sitting with uh, an elder or elders from a tribe called the Hadza, H-A-D-Z-A is what it's called, Hadza. And the Hadza are the, are the oldest living hunter-gatherers on the planet that still are living the hunter, hunting and gathering lifestyle, that still do that and haven't been marginalized or pushed out of their, their land and this sort of thing. So I'm sitting around the fire, uh, and this was the, the group that was in The Gods Must Be Crazy, that film. And also, they're on the uh, homepage of National Geographic as the original peoples and all these DNA studies that show that our lives lead back to, to them in many ways. So I'm sitting around the fire with a man named Kampala. He's 98 years old. He's still buff and vital, and they're small, and he's small. and, and uh, we're sitting there, and through a translator, I'm interviewing him about how to become an elder, and eventually gets tired of the, my rap. And uh, he says, can we take a break? And uh, he said, sure, and they're very high touch. So he takes my hand and goes away from the fire, and he says, Richard, do you know what the two most important days in your life are? And I said, what would you have said? Birth and death. I, that's what I said. I said, birth and death, and then, ugh. He said, you, you write these books, you came all the way over here on an airplane, I've never been on an airplane, you came out here in a Land Rover, you're sleeping in a tent, I'm sleeping around the fire, you don't even know the answer to the most core question. And I said, well, what is the answer? He said, well, you got the first one right, birth. But the second one is, in our culture, in the Hadza culture, first important day is birth, the second most important day is when you discover why you were born. You feel part of our community, and you find your place in our, our community. And I went, wow, that's why I interview elders, and that's why I go to places like this to get this, this, uh, this kind of wisdom. So, Frankel, elders, African uh, elders, in, in indigenous people. The fourth is part of my own, my own story. Uh, a little over a year ago, my wife was uh, diagnosed with cancer. And uh, she had never had cancer. I had never been sick myself. Neither one of us had been to a hospital before, in a, in a hospital, rather, before. And one of my clients is a Mayo Clinic, and I live in Minneapolis. And uh, so I called the Mayo Clinic to get, let's, I said, Sally, let's go down for a second opinion. She had thyroid cancer. And uh, so uh, I kind of called in my, my chips, and we, we uh, got an appointment with Dr. John Morris, who's the head of uh, endocrinology for Mayo. So we got down there at 159, after doing the tests and everything, we got down there at 159 and um, two, for a two o'clock appointment. And at two o'clock, we walk into his office and the wall is all plaques, certificates and honors and awards and all of this. And uh, 
he's got a couch, and I can see over there he's got his technology. He's got his computer and her files sitting on the desk. And he's got this couch and chair, and he says, Richard, why don't you sit over here, sort of out of the way? And Sally, why don't you sit here right in front of me? And uh, my wife is terrified. And she hadn't been sick like this before. She's terrified of the potential scarring of having surgery, of cancer, and where else it might be, and all. And I'm scared, too. But I am ushered off to the side. And he sits right in front of Sally. And he says, Sally, I want you to tell me your story from the beginning. When did you first notice the signs of this? An hour and 10 minutes later, we walked out of there, never having looked at the technology, never having looked at the files. He'd studied all of that. But my wife was in a different body. She was confident that somebody got her. And the message in that for me around story, purpose, this is a man who really got it, who had a sense of purpose, like the police chief in, in his, his work. Uh, who embodied it, and she had her surgery down at Mayo. It was, she had her thyroid removed. It was successful. She's fine. But she and I, to this day, can remember that don't ever let technology hijack the human moment. I'm old for technology, but purpose, passion, as it's embodied in story, is, is, uh, is critical. So uh, those are four elements, but let me pull it all together with a final story. Back to Africa uh, for a moment here. Different tribe, the Maasai tribe, uh, referencing the, the book about repacking your bags. So picture yourself walking in a corridor along the Serengeti Plains of East Africa. There's this corridor between the Serengeti and the Great Rift Valley where the Maasai live and where I've been hiking for years. And I'm hiking alongside a man named uh, Koye, who's an elder in the Maasai tribe. And this is the first time Koye's ever been with folks like us. And, and we've all got big backpacks on. And I'm the leader of the trip, so I've instructed you on what to carry in your backpack. But Koye, as we're walking along next to each other, he keeps looking over his shoulder at my pack. And he notices that I'm getting shorter by the minute because I'm laboring. They call it slogging in the, in the trade um, under the weight of this pack. And uh, we get to the village where we're going to be camping for the night, and I put my pack down, and Koye comes over to me, and he says, Richard, what are you carrying in there? Can you show me what's, what is in this? Because he's carrying nothing. He's walking upright with a spear and a herding stick, and he's taking in all the landscape while I'm looking at the ground in front of me one step at a time. We, we all have days like that, right? And so uh, I open my pack, and I start to take everything out to share what's in there with him, put a little tarp on the, on the ground, and out comes the expedition first aid kit, the Gore-Tex rain gear, the root finders, the water filters, and he's in amazement, but every little kid in the village is now out there looking at all this stuff, yakking, and he's keeping them away. And at the end of this uh, experiment of looking at everything, he looks it all over and very judiciously he comes over and he says, Richard, tell me, does all this make you happy? And I paused and said, uh, no. And I went back to my tent, put my pack in, came out to the group. You're sitting in the group around the fire. And I said, this is what just happened. I'm going to lighten my load. I'm going to leave half of my stuff at the village here and only take the essentials with me for the next phase of the trip. And then the discussion that evening was, well, what are the essentials for the trip? Well, I wrote down my notes that night in my journal, and I said, repack your bag, lighten your load, which became a book which is now out in 20, 23 languages. So here is the lesson in repacking your bags. Here's the four essentials. I came back from that trip, and I researched purpose at yet another level. I started to study the good life. Back from Aristotle and uh, other times forward, what it constitutes the good life? There were four characteristics. Place, uh, people, right work, and purpose. As I looked at everything, health, money, I took that off the table. I looked at the other essentials. 
Are you living in the place you belong, with the people you love, while doing the right work on purpose? Those were the, the four essentials. Place has to do with geography, community, uh, where you do your work. People has to do with tribe. When you, look, when you boil all the happiness research down, and you've all heard it or looked at it, it gets down to two things, really, purpose and tribe. So people has to do with who's in your tribe. This is tribe, I think, because tribe, the way I define it, is shared path. Who's on the shared path with you? Uh, right work is livelihood, and purpose is uh, ultimately the reason that we, we get up in the morning. So let me give you the formula very quickly and then exit, uh, exit the stage with a final quote. The formula for right work, G plus P plus V. Gifts plus passions plus values equals right livelihood or right work. Are you using your gifts, your strengths, your most passionate, motivated skills on things, P, that you feel passionate about in an environment that honors your values and gives you voice and dignity. That's why we have the 30% figure or the 20% figure I submit to you is that people aren't using their gifts on things they care about, particularly environments that honor their values. So let me close by saying this. E.B. White sort of summed it up for me about this whole purpose conversation and it was this. He says, I arise in the morning torn between a desire to save the world and a desire to savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. I think our lives are about that creative tension between saving the world or doing purposeful things that connect with our tribe and community and savoring and doing things that make us happy. Thank you for the generosity of your listening. <laughs>